Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name's Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host for the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Joining me in our podcast studios this week is Dr. Jian Chung. Uh, Dr. Chung is a professor and virologist at Iowa State University Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Uh, you may know uh, Dr. Zhang from his uh, probably more well-known uh, nickname, JQ. And uh, to save me the embarrassment of, of mispronouncing his name over and over again, uh, JQ, if it's okay with you, I will just refer to you as Dr. JQ for the rest of the podcast. How's that? Certainly. <laughs> no problem. Well, uh, JQ, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for quite a, quite a few years now, and you've helped me with a lot of complicated purse cases, but there may be some folks out there that haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before. Would you please give the audience a bit of an introduction? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Jian Xiang Zhang. As uh, Clayton said, my colleagues generally just call me Dr. JQ Zhang. So my background is a little different. I do not have a DVM degree. But I graduated from you know, Beijing Medical University and uh, School of Public Health majoring in preventive medicine. And then you know, I got uh, my master's degree from China CDC. Then I came to the U.S. for my PhD. Actually, my PhD degree is um, uh, equine viruses, equine derived virus from the University of Kentucky. Then in 2010, I joined the Iowa State University Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, then switched to swine viruses. So that's about my education background. Very good. Well, we're here to talk about swine viruses and PERS virus in particular. I understand, uh, JQ, that you and your, and your friends at the Diagnostic Lab have been doing some work on PERS virus isolation evaluating the efficacy of different cell types to isolate PERS virus. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about what your research is there and what you're learning? Of course, today you asked me to specifically talk about uh, PERS virus isolation. So we know that um, when we do the testing, veterinarians submit the samples for PERS testing, we generally run PERS screening PCR first. If it's a negative, we stop there. If it's a positive, sometimes veterinarians request uh, all for five sequencing. If they find out that it's a pretty unique or interesting virus strain, they sometimes they request uh, post virus isolation to get uh, isolated for alternative vaccine production or for you know the further investigation like uh, the PIX study for pathogenesis study or even to do some strain-specific neutralization test. So all of this, you know, we need to do the isolation. For PERS isolation, most of the lab have been using the cell line called the Mark 45 cells for PERS VI. However, the success rate is uh, frustratingly low, you know. That's why some labs have been using pulsine available macrophages, we call the PEM cells. So that has a better success rate. However, the PEM cells is the primary uh, cells. You need to make the cells from the pig, you know, tissues. Uh, you know, also there could be the batch to batch variations. Uh, so basically the quality checking part is a challenge. So that's why not many labs have been routinely used PEM cells. So after the ZMEC cell line, this is the uh, one cell line derived from PEM cells. After ZMEC cells, uh, the cell line became available, we wanted to compare if this uh, ZMEC cell line will improve PERS virus isolation compared to Mark 45 cells. So that's why the first project we did it while my uh, graduate student did that, uh, we select the clinical samples, including null samples, serum samples, oral flu samples, processing flu samples, and we compared the PERS VI in two cell line, MAC45 and the MAC cells, you know. So the first finding is uh, kind of interesting. We all know that oral flu and processing flu have been widely used for surveillance testing. Excellent, okay, for PCR testing. Sometimes even for antibody testing, great. However, back to PERS VI, 
we do not have a good success rate to isolate uh, first from oral fluid and processing fluid samples, no matter which cell line you have been using. So that's why the first message I want to deliver to, to you and the audience is that uh, about the specimen type for pulse VI. So oral fluid and processing fluid are not the top choices. Actually, the long sample and the serum samples are top two uh, choices for pulse VI. So back to long and serum samples. So when we uh, compare the several situations, number one, you just have this plus one, you know, European strain. Number two, you have both the plus one and the plus two strains. Number three, you just have the plus two, you know, North American strain in the clinical samples. We compared the plus VI in two cell lines, you know. So for specifically, we focus on serum and the long samples, okay? So no mate is the, those of which situation is the plus one alone, plus two alone, or co-infection. They make cells always give the better success rate to isolate the pulse compared to Mark 45 cells. So this is the second, you know, point I wanted to make it, you know. The third point is about the CT values, you know. So we also compared the pulse VI in this uh, serum and lung samples with the different CT values. And you know, CT lower, you have a high concentration, you know. So basically, we recommend to attempt the process virus isolation in serum and lung samples with a CT less than 30. Because once you have that uh, sample with a CT over 30, even using ZMAC cells, the success rate is still very low. So for cost effectiveness, uh, we recommend uh, lung samples and uh, serum samples for parts of VI. Okay, this is the uh, third point I wanted to <laughs> uh, make you aware of that. Uh, uh, the next point is uh, about the lineage, you know, you, as you know, for the awful five best genetic lineages. Nowadays, in the U.S., mainly the, the lineage 1, lineage 5, and the lineage 8 are uh, circulating in the U.S. In, in recent years. Of course, for the lineage 5, most of those detected lineage 5 sequences uh, are actually the BI, you know, NGLVAC, MLV vaccine-like viruses. So then we compared the plus VI success rate in two cell lines, you know, analyzed about the lineages. So we found out that for lineage 1 and lineage 8, we have the better success rate, VI success rate in the max cells compared to Monk 45. But for the lineage 5, the PIMLV vaccine-like uh, samples, uh, the success rate are similar in Monk 45 and the max cells. Okay, so this is the, um, maybe, I don't remember, the, this may be number four point. <laughs> and then uh, another, you know, point is uh, people are curious uh, whether the isolate obtained in ZMAC cells uh, will grow in Mark 45 cells or not. Because, uh, you know, some alternative vaccine companies, they still use uh, Mark 45 in their production line. You know? So... Sometimes if we forward the make cell isolated to them, they say, oh, sorry, we cannot use this, you know. So we also, you know, investigated that we select 82, you know, uh, ZMAC isolate, we test if it grow in Mark 55 cells or not. We find out that roughly 57% of ZMAC isolate grow in Mark 45 isol uh, cells, but around uh, 43% of ZMAC isolate did not grow in Mark 45 cells. So that is, um, yeah, it's um, at least uh, some, you know, message we need to be aware of that because um, some alternative vaccine companies may not be able to use that. So that's why uh, currently uh, some client requests us to adapt ZMAC isolate to grow in Mark 45 cells before forward that isolate to the alternative vaccine company. So this is um, the first the project related to to approach of VI, you know. Thank you, Dr. Young. I uh, really appreciate you coming on to the show and helping to educate us on the importance of PERS virus isolation 
as well as what you're seeing when we compare the historical Mark cell lines to some of the maybe not as easy to use cell lines like the pulmonary alveolar macrophages and some cell lines that look pretty promising to help us isolate more viruses, particularly relevant viruses in our clinical samples, the ZMAX cell lines. We're going to close that up for part one of this two-part series with Dr. JQ, uh, and we hope that you come back and join us for part two next week. Dr. Young will talk to us a little bit about uh, what he finds when he actually sequences the successful viruses he's the isolating off of his various cell lines. And a uh, little, little teaser in here, sometimes it's a surprise what virus he happens to find in those clinical samples. It may not match perfectly the sequence he was expecting. So please come back and join us for part two next week. For Dr. J.Q. Young, uh, I want to thank you uh, all for coming on and joining us uh, at the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. If you haven't visited our website, please go visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss out on our follow-up episode next week. Thank you very much for joining us for part one. Look forward to seeing you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com, and we would love to take a look at your research.